the one who made my dreams come true a few kisses ago. I remember you. You're the one who said I, I love you too. Yes, I do. Didn't you know? I remember too a distant bell and stars that fell like the rain out of the blue. When my life is through and the angels ask me to recall the thrill of it all. Then I will tell them I remember you. I remember too a distant bell and stars that fell just like the rain out of the blue. And the angels ask me to
Anthony. These are all in black and white, you know. Yeah. 90% of them are. All right, can you? Go ahead. All right. This is Abel Fletcher, one of Maslow's least known men and a very successful photographer. He invented what is called the paper negative, which has done a lot of photo photography that we have are in the in at the uh, museum and around town were made on those slides, those, that negative. All right. Los Angeles Museum, when, when after Abel Fletcher died, Mrs. and Mrs. Fletcher and her daughter went to California. And out there, they, they said that they gave them all of his information, all of his materials. They maintained they loaned it to him. But regardless, we only got a portion of it back. Now on this, they maintain that he was possibly the inventor of the paper negative. But there isn't any real facts on that. An Englishman has, has always received the credit for that. Okay. His studio was up on the top floor of the building with the peak roof. That was made by the Wellmans. That was the, called the Wellman block. And uh, he was in there for years. He took pictures out the front and the back windows, both directions, up the street and down the street. And it was, a, of course, a couple other uh, later photographers moved into that same place. Now, from that peak roof on to the right, that is where the old First National Bank stood. Okay. Now, do you have it? Ready? Uh, this uh, building was built, this picture was taken by Abel Fletcher out of his studio windows facing northeast. And the building that we're looking at was built after the disastrous fire that wiped out the entire block from Erie Street and Main Street up to Mill Street, or which is today First Street. And it wiped out everything from Erie to First back to Federal, with the exception of one building only was saved in that, which was back on Federal. Now, that building is still standing, and they have built onto that. Uh, they've changed the front of the uh, third and the fourth building. The third one is a Conrad uh, hardware store. They changed that a long, long time ago. I don't ever remember it when it didn't look like it does today. The next building is where Duncan is in, and that is completely changed on the inside or outside the front of that building. Now that also, you walk into that store, you'll notice you walk in on one left street level and you get in there at the back end of the store while you'll see that there are steps going up to where the old floor was. Now up at that roof line, notice those marks up there on the right at the roof line. Now those you still can see on the first two buildings on the corner of Erie and Main Street. Or I should, I should say Main and Lincoln Street, uh, Lincoln and uh, Erie Street. That, uh, those marks are still in there, and it is part of the building. This was Abel Fletcher's daguerreotype, looking straight across Lincoln, or Lincoln Way West, clear across town, and there you see the big building there to the left, on the other side of the bridge, that was the old Union Hotel, and that stood there for great, just so oh, in the last, I suppose about the 1930s, something like that, when that was torn down. Up on the skyline on the upper left is the, the uh, power of the steeple of the old Presbyterian Church. Now this picture was taken in 1852. It's a daguerreotype taken by Fletcher. Over on the right-hand side, the skyline, you'll see a tower up there. And that is the top of where Skinner and Duncan had their woolen mill. Now, that looked right straight across town, and by the way, that main bridge that you see right there across the river stood there until it was torn down just in about the 18, uh, eight, late 1840s or early 50s. They did put a, a walkway on each side of it, but the center of it did remain the same. Now, it looks like these two buildings are standing side by side. They are not. 
The dark building is directly in back of the white building. The white building is the church, the uh, building was built by the Masons and the Methodists. And that stood right on the corner of Park Row and Charles. Now that's hard for you to replace today because those buildings, those streets are not, uh, the Park Row is there, but the Charles Street doesn't go through there. They built that building, the two of them, the Methodists met on the first floor and the uh, Masons met on the second floor. The dark building was the Duncan Flour Mill, or Duncan Wool Mill, that was in back of them on the corner, well, that's the reason we're on the southeast corner of, of City Hall Court and Charles. And uh, Skinner and uh, Duncan were in that together. Now that tower is the one that you saw on that bed, the picture was taken from clear across town. Okay. Okay, this is another picture that, Dun uh, that uh, Fletcher took out of his studio window facing down on South Erie Street. The buildings, up until a couple of years ago, all of those buildings were still standing. But the one big building right in the center is the old stone block that was built in 1840. And that was built of stone, so finely cut that they did not put any mortar in between the blocks. They just stood those one right on top of the other. That has the old shed roof on that building. The one clear down there is the old Tremont house with the original roof on it. The other one on this side here was a Siler cigar store, or not Siler, uh, Swarm. Snyder. Snyder cigar store was right in there. The building on this side was the old, uh, that was a Swarm's. Uh, uh, kind of a hotel, a, a little bit of everything was in that particular building. Now you look on this street, you see all these stone hitching posts going up and down the street here. By the way, those are not stone, those are uh, cast iron. Snowy day, and you can see right straight down Erie Street. Okay. The one on this side, I'm not too sure of everything I'm saying about that. I think you're better off to start with the second and the third one down, the big stone building and the last one down there. Although I'm going to show you another picture of both of those buildings, or especially the one way down at the other end, a better picture than that. Yes, and I'm not I'm not too sure what I said about that either, that, that Snyder cigar store. I'm not sure Snyder was in there at that time. That's that yellow brick building there today. Uh, I don't know what this is. It was up on the top of it. I think it says Bloomfield. Bloomfield Furniture Store. And uh, Eaton had their office up there on the third floor for a long time. They're out of there now. That whole building is still, still standing there. That was built, I think, in 29. This is a later picture taken from the ground, and this is not a Fletcher picture. So far, I've shown you nothing but Fletcher pictures. This is down on South Erie Street, looking directly south. There you've got the stone hitching posts in along the edge, dirt roads, mud roads, horse parked on the wrong side of the street. And the old stone block down there is now has a mansard roof on there. That was not on the original building, and I showed you that in the picture preceding this one. The building right this side of that stone block is the Snyder, Snyder Cigar Factory, where they made cigars right there. And we could walk by there. I remember walking by there and watching them sit right against the window and making cigars right on a table right in front of the window. Okay. That picture down at the end, by the way, that's the old uh, Tremont house. Uh, that the big building on the uh, on the uh, the other side of the stone block. I got a good detailed picture of that. This is Siler's Cigar Factory. It is in the Tremont House or Tremont Hotel. 
They were in there for quite a few years. That was a leading cigar manufacturer in Masson. And they made an awful lot of cigars at that place. I'm just sick that I never went through that building. And I should have when it was when the uh, lady had her antique shop there. But I always thought, well, it'll be there forever, and I'll get through it later. Now, you'll notice that is still the original roof on that hotel. Okay. Those are workers, making cigar workers. You have that picture up there, uh, John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they're just the, the, the people out in front are the ma people that made the cigars for uh, uh, Siler Cigar Factory. Those all had to be made by hand at that time. All right, now this is still the Tremont house, but this has the mansard roof. It has changed hands a number of times. Originally it was called the Tremont house. The next thing I ever heard it called was the Siler Hotel. And then later on it was called the, uh, uh, community. Can't think of the name of that one either. It isn't too important. It didn't say that way very long. Then it uh, became the, uh, the Erie Hotel, which is what it was when the hotel burned. But that's a beautiful building. It really is. That's, uh, it just makes you sick clear through to think that that building is not standing to this day. Ready? Yeah. All right. This was the, the American house that stood on the uh, southwest, no, on the north, northwest corner of Lincoln Way and First Street East. And this is the original building. Now I remember the old balconies out in front of that building. They were, weren't taken down too many. Well, they were taken down in the late 40s. And the roof there, you can see up there, you have eight chimneys up there on the right side of that roof. Now in the old days when that building was still standing, you could see where the change was made in the roof lining going across there. But uh, at that time, why this was the original American house, or Conrad Hotel, as it's known today. That was built in the 1850s. This is the Conrad Hotel, the way I remembered. Now, you'll see how much they added on to the back of that hotel. They added on, you cut back eight chimneys, and the bounce that was added on at a later date. And back at the end, you'll see at the, on the ground level there, there's an arched doorway. That was a, uh, there was a, a livery stable back in there at that time. There was a fire in there at one time, but it was not very dangerous. And they uh, put it out, but they made the livery stable move. You see the same balconies there. You see, they have now dropped in, a, put a porch in there, with a sunken porch. And I can remember some of the women's objecting to walking down, because you always had your hangers on, sitting on that porch with their feet up on the rail. And uh, the women would go by there, and they say, now, they knew they were being talked about the minute they walked by there, but there was no other way of getting around the town at that time if you wanted to be on that side of the street. There was these, uh, uh, Henrik had a grocery store in there, and the next one, and there was a, a saloon in there also, Meyer Saloon. They were in there for years. The stable? Yeah. Yes, way at the back there. Your hand's kind of covering it a little bit there. When you, that's all right. Okay. Yes, the back arch back there. Okay. This is, was been known as the Atwater Warehouse for years, but the building, the double building, as you see there, was built originally by the Wellmans when they came to Maslin. But they gave up on that, and the Atwaters just came to town, and they bought that. And that building was used for feed and grain, flour, and things of that type up until it was torn down, which was in the 1930s. 
Now, every building you see there is now gone. The double house, that's the, uh, the building there to the right. The next one you see is a brick building. That was out on Lincoln Way. And across the street was the old Beatty Block. And that was on the north side of uh, Lincoln Way. And there is the Canal Bridge. In the line right below here, you'll see barges in here, regular canal boats. And I think that's mostly coal that's in there. Massa was a very well-known coal center back at the 1900s. The, uh, of course, this is the old canal, Erie Canal, and it was a very successful route through here uh, up until oh, just about the 1900s was when they knew then it was fading out because of the railroads coming through here. By the way, if you look on the east side of the Senior Citizen Building downtown, you'll see the outline of the Atwater Warehouse on that building. I took a picture of that, too. This is a picture taken by Charlie Geis. It will be taken what is today be about the second floor of the McLean, or the uh, uh, Maslin Building, looking southeast. And I said that I had said it was a Bartriff that was on that wagon, but a lady corrected me on that and said, now this is, that was my father who was a plaster here in Maslin at that time on that plaster wagon of his driving his team through town. It's the first time I knew that. Then I found out later that Judge Charlie Geist gave me the picture. The man on the side there in his shirt sleeves was uh, Bayless. Now those houses, those buildings on the right-hand side there Nearly all of those buildings are still standing up until the largest building on the left side of that whole group. And that's where the old uh, uh, Hess Snyder building stood, or later on the Ideal was in there, and then it was the Ameritrust, which is now in pretty bad shape. But the buildings on this side of it are all the original buildings there. Now they've changed the front end on some of those and the roof lines on some of them. But the buildings are all there, the same, that are in this picture. By the way, there's your streetcar tracks coming in. That's the first we've seen those. These are coming into Masson. Now, the streetcar tracks, originally, your city car lines went in four different directions. They went, come in from the east, from Canton, and the city lines went out to about 16th Street. Then they turned around and come back into town. They went south on South Erie Street, originally down to the cemetery. Then later on, they went down to the state hospital. The other line went west on up on Lincoln Way West up and on Main Street up to about 16th Street. And then they went north on 1st Street, northeast, out to Cherry, up Cherry to Amherst, and out Amherst, and it went out to uh, Roch, where it stopped. And then the, what they would do, they'd have to get out of there. There would be one man in there. The motorman would take the money, and he'd also tr turn the car around. He didn't turn the car around. He would pull the trolley down and then walk around to the other end of the car, put it up on the line, take his paraphernalia from the front of the car to around to the other end of it, and he'd be ready to go. And they would go like that. They would have to come into the square of town, which is right here, is where they would come into. There they would pass and then go on their different directions again. The big inner urban cars would come in here from Canton, and they would go up, to, uh, they went up to Cleveland and come down to Canton and down as far as uh, a new Philly and, and uh, De Denison, down through there. They were down there. And uh, they also later built a streetcar line that went out to East Greenville. This was called the Menick Block originally, and uh, then Falks bought it oh, around 1900. Menick's built this around 1862, and uh, it was a, quite a building there. The second floor why, was where Doc Hattery, who was possibly Mass's best-known physician, we used to call him Second Peter Hattery here later on. When he got an automobile, he never seemed to take that car out of second gear, and he would go all over town, every place around here. And then on the left side of that second floor was where Doc Manuere uh, was a dentist, had his headquarters. The building up to the extreme left there was where the uh, inner urbans went for years. That's where you would get your car, your street cars going, especially your inner urban cars, 
either, uh, especially go east on that. You would get it from Canton there and on up to Akron. It went up from Canton to Akron, went through North Canton. Of course, most of the time that was called New, B New Berlin up there. And uh, then it went to Akron and Akron up to Cleveland. Now down here in this lower right-hand corner, you'll see this large block there. That is a stone drinking trough. And it's just too bad there wasn't a horse there drinking at that time. Because they would come there and they would get, they would drink out of that stone drinking trough. And why they ever knocked that down and took it away, I'll never know. But they did it. And that's right at the side of the park. You can see it, the park's right there. And there's, they have torn that building down and they have the building, matter of fact, it's the building we're in right now, is what they built in that particular place. City Hall, taken around 1909. And by the way, there is a Crocs and Keaton automobile standing there. A man standing against a tree leaning on that. He's part of the picture. And, uh, of course, the Crocs and Keaton was made here in Masson. And at one time it was considered one of the finest cars in the country. It went, from, it went across country also on some of those tours. It's just too bad they tore that building down because it was really a beautiful building. But nevertheless, it's gone. Okay, this is on the south west corner of Lincoln's, Lincoln Way East and First Street. And that is the building that stood right there where the Hess Snyder Building or Ameritrust stood for years. And that uh, building on the extreme left hand corner, that was the old Kierkoffer Drugstore. And I know as a kid, I was the oldest one in the family, and it was my job to. Uh, go down to get all the drugs. I had to go to Kierkoffers to get the drugs and I'd have to go down to uh, Fisher's on South Erie Street to have the shoes sold and get to pick them up. And those were a couple of jobs that were mine. And uh, not that I particularly appreciated them, but I had to do them. And the next star in there is the uh, where uh, Shinochle and Meyer had their tailor shop in there. And the third one is the old Weffler Saloon. And that was a very, very uh, important place here in town. And I, the swinging doors there, I always wanted to go in there, but no way a kid ever get in a saloon in those days. They had a nice brass uh, banister uh, railing going up there to up about three or four steps. And uh, they had these peaked pieces on the top of it. But uh, nevertheless, it was uh, very well the swinging doors were going all the time. The third one over to the right. Yes. Now those are three separate buildings, and I found that out by going over some papers by, of the Hess estate, that uh, they originally bought just the the Weffler part of that, and I can I can find in their papers when they brought the other two thirds of that building, but they originally bought the Weffler part of it there, and it goes clear back. Uh, uh, to the end of that building, as you can see, it doesn't go all the way back to the alley, to Diamond Alley, but it does go quite a ways back there. Okay. Wait a minute now, that... Yes, that's one of the original Kendall houses, right there. Still standing. You shouldn't mention that in the well, All right, now this was taken from the top of the standpipe around 1890. And you can see down there that tall steeple straight ahead there, the tall tower, that's on the old North Street School, which is where the Longfellow School stands today. And over at the extreme left, you can see a steeple, it's a pointed steeple there, and that is the old Methodist Church that was only up three or four years when it burned down. Over to the extreme right, You'll see some other towers down there. That is St. Mary's Church. Now, this, the street that you see, this biggest building in the front, 
That is what today is called Park Ro or Park uh, View. And that is the old Hyman home. And later on, they had a grocery store that was, I'm not sure it was in that building, but it was awful close to it. The next street over was that building that I said was the original building, one of the original uh, Kendall buildings. That's on 11th Street. And that's going right straight across there. Now, the building over here to the extreme left on that corner is the old L House. And you can't see it too well, but it's there. It's a... Uh, it was part of it was built out on State Street. The other part went back on 11th Street. Of course, at that time it was called Third Street. The other building is still that little white building next to there. It's still standing, and the one down at the extreme left end that's still standing. You've got a good light picture there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the, the, I was showing my pictures up at the Massa Museum one night, and while I was showing them, there was some laughter at the back of the room. And uh, they were really laughing loud. And I couldn't understand what it was about because I'm not a comedian, and I said nothing funny. And uh, it was a terrible night that night. And one of the women of the group there lived out close, uh, close to where we do. And so I said, well, I'd take her home. And then the other lady said she'd take the other three home. On the way home, I said, what the, the dickens was you laughing at back there? And, well, she wouldn't tell me. But she told me on the way home also she had a lot of pictures at home that if I wanted to come up and look at them, I could have them. So boy, oh boy, I was up there in one big hurry. We sat down, we went through the pictures, and then we finally came to this picture. And I said, all right, I'll tell you what we were laughing about now. That house right there was on the Lincoln Way East, Bacanton Masson Road, and you can see it's right there next to the creek. You're looking north, and there's the standpipe. And while we were looking at that, or while I was showing my picture, someone in the group back there, someone who had a picture of the Valley House, and, uh, well, of course, no one knew, and uh, they got to laughing about the Valley House. One lady was very hard of hearing, and she wouldn't know what the laughing was about. And they didn't dare tell her, because it would be shrouded all over the room. With the result that uh, nobody said anything more about it that night, but they had a hard time cutting and shutting this one lady up. Anyhow, she said, now that's the story on that. That's the Valley House, Massel's leading house of real, ill repute, right on the main road <laughs> between Massel and Canton. And he said, would you want it? I said, do I want it? Boy, I grabbed that picture in a hurry, and I've got an excellent picture of it. That was taken, I think it was 18, what does it say there, 18, seven, there's, there's a date, 98. And by the way, when they started to widen up the canton Masson Road, there was, they were taken to court on that to shut to tear that house down. And uh, I have a couple of pictures of that, of the, uh, along with the, uh, the numbers that are on the back of the picture when they were being sued. And, uh, but I can't get any information out of the, um, the recorder's office about that at all. They just they've either destroyed the files on it or they mislaid them or something. But anyhow, they are gone. As you can see, it's looking directly north. There's the this, this house of ill repute, the Valley House. Up above it is the old standpipe that was a city landmark here. And I tell you, I'm sick clear through. They ever tore that down. I worked up in Cleveland for 12 years. And coming down from Cleveland, when I get down and I can see that standpipe about four or five miles north of Mass, and I knew I was home. The Opera House, built in 1870 by a man by the name of Booker. And it was considered the most beautiful opera house between Pittsburgh and Detroit, uh, east and west, and down as far as Cincinnati on the south. It was a big building, and it was, had four floors. You'll see it here. There's a big, wide two uh, stairs going up to the second floor. And on the third floor was the main floor of the, uh, the opera house, on the second floor of the, the top floor there was the balcony that they also would sit up there. A very, very handsome building. This stood on the northwest corner of uh, Charles and 
South Erie Street. Now, out there in the middle of the street, you notice that thing hanging down? It looks like it's hanging right down the middle of the side there, between the opera house and the side of the picture. That's the old-fashioned street light. That's the arc street light. And we as kids, we used to watch them for that man to come around. And he'd come around, and he would carry a little stool with him, and the legs would be these glass insulators that were on up at the top of the poles up there. And he'd break that out in about the middle of the street. Then he'd go over to the corner, untie a rope, and let that down. And then he would go out there and stand on that stool. And he would t let the uh, globe down. He'd wipe that globe out, take out that old black carbon. And uh, we kids were always around ready to grab that because we could mark, mark all over the street on the sidewalks there, play follow the leader and everything else on that. And he would put in a new carbon and pull it back up again wrap the cord or wrap the rope around the telephone post and nobody ever thought about breaking those things at that time and I can't imagine them having it up overnight today without having somebody bust them. Well, when did they tear that down? Finally it was done in uh, oh nuts I've got they took the top floor off in 29 and they tore that down. Oh, I'm not sure. I've got that written down, too. Was it down by the end of the 30s? No, it wasn't. Because that's when they put the parking lot in there. So even into the 40s, part of it's still there. Yes, I say it was. All right, this was the interior of the opera house. And they had the top actors and actresses from all over the country who would come to Maslin to this opera house because it was such a beautiful one. And it uh, later on, of course, why it, the balconies were torn down. They put a skating rink up there. They had a huge one of these mechanical uh, organs up there that played all kinds of music for the skaters. And it was uh, quite a place of attraction for a long time. Finally, it just all wore out. This is Lincoln Way East, looking, looking east from the Canal Bridge. Now, you'll notice there's a little hump in the Canal Bridge here. Right here is where the, where the canal went under the Lincoln Way, and the uh, canal boats would go under there. And they could, uh, it was high enough that they could go right under there and go straight through. Now, on there's your stone hitching post on the uh, left side here. And you'll see the outline of a hat about halfway up on the extreme left side. And that was a man that had a hat store right there. Now, the buildings that you see in the next block there are all still standing. Cornell is in that one building there. It's still there. This was taken before 1892 because that's when the streetcar line came through. Also, there's the Methodist Church steeple. In the one that they built up there, the first church, the Methodist built up there, which built, I think it was in 1888 and burned down in 1892. And I know that uh, I ran across a picture that Father had taken, or Father had in his collection of things that he had, because I come across this uh, thing of the uh, history of Masson by nature from him, because he always had a lot of things that he collected. And on the back of his picture, he had written that Mother and he had their first date the night that this place caught fire, and he said, we didn't set fire to it either. And I didn't see that till a long time afterwards. Now, the buildings on the right are still there. That's where Tommy Kimmons' office is in that first building on the right side there, and going right up, straight up through there. And then there's all there except where the Ameritrust is today. That is the... Uh, that's the only thing that's changed in that particular picture through here. The, now, if you'll notice those crossbars on the telephone post. Now, there's only, what, there's four or five of them there. And that's the way the lines are going through Masson now, or at that time. This was back in around 1890. He had his head out there. A doll's hat store? Doll's hats or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now you're looking up Lincoln Way again, take from the same place, 
uh, streetcar tracks are now in. So we're getting around to about 1900. And there to the left, you'll see a peanut wagon there. Now that peanut wagon was quite an important part of the mass of people's life. It was, you'd come downtown, and you'd come down on, the, especially on Saturday night, and you could hear that whistle blowing on his roaster all over town. And everybody ended up with a bag of peanuts. And uh, we'd end up, we'd break our shells, throw them on the sidewalk. I don't know how in the world they ever cleaned all those peanut shells up, but they did. And uh, we'd have peanuts all over town. The shells would be all over town. Again, those buildings on the left and on the right are still, well, the one on the extreme left is not standing. On the extreme right are standing, except way up at the far end. And uh, now you'll notice the telephone posts have more bars across there for, for wires to go through. And I said one time, I showed these up at the Presbyterian Church, and I said that they were light wires. And uh, Mr. Dawson, who was just retired, to him up me after he said those are not light wires those are telephone wires now how he can tell a telephone wire from a light wire I don't know but he said that's what they were so I say they are now telephone wires but we must have had an awful lot of telephones in town at that time up there is a new Methodist church there's the tower up there and I think that's in more pictures of Masson than any other thing in Masson that's wherever picture you take it no matter where you take it from somebody you see excuse me seem to get into that tower there's your streetcars coming down, and that's getting ready to turn down South Erie Street. I'm not sure, but that looks like it's an open streetcar. If it is, we used to have those in the summertime. And uh, you'd get in on those, you'd get in on the side, all the way across the running board, all the way across the side, and you'd get in and you'd slide across the seat. And you would, depend on how many people you picked up, where you ended up in that thing, whether in the middle or the far end or this end. But... Uh, it just depended on the things of that type. But it was, a, it was a great way to ride around. It was a quick way to ride around in Maslin in those days. They didn't stop at Belton Village. What? They didn't stop at Belton Village. Belton Village? <laughs> you have to cleave them. Could you say that again? I had stopped. That's, that's a city card. This was taken from the chimney the smokestack, the chimney at the uh, Reed Glass Factory, which stood directly south of the Pennsylvania Railroad track as it would go into the station. This was looking north, and there is your Ohio Canal again. You see some barges out there in the canal. You can see the lumber parked along or stacked along the side there. That's the Brown Lumber Company. The other building, the big building over there to the right, that's the Hess Snyder building that burned down oh shortly before the uh, post office was built. These houses along here were the uh, houses right along the canal. Now in there you see a couple of paths. One of them is the towpath. That's where the horses or the mules would pull the barge through. The other one is Canal Street at that time, which is today is First Street Southwest. That's looking directly north. That's a handsome picture. Now that bridge that you that bridge that you had there that was South Street. Yep. Yeah. Well, I heard that they used to make cigar boxes. Yes, I've read that time and time again. Oh, I don't know. I just found them from different places. People gave them to me, and I found them in other collections of other people's uh, pictures. I have the faintest idea where I found an awful lot of these pictures. This was taken by Stan Bosley, and he took quite a few pictures around town. You have a lot of those pictures of his up there at the museum. And this is taken from Park Row, or, yeah, Park Row, looking directly east on Charles Street. Now you no longer can get that picture. That's all built over now by city buildings. And there is the old uh, Duncan and uh, Skinner uh, wool factory right there on the extreme left. They're taking it down piece by piece. 
on the extreme left here is the city hall and the next building over is the fire station and up farther is the archer carriage shop way up at the end of the street that home is still standing that's up on third street and it uh, that's where many albright live the building on the right was the old Becker studio and if you I have a picture of the back of that too I'm not sure they have it on slide or not but the back of that building is of course faces directly east is all windows all up and down the back of that that's where he had his studio back there where he could take pictures when he wanted a lot of light uh, he could take them back in there and they really got light I say this makes me sick about this picture. This is the uh, first savings and loan, and it was built in 1916. And at that time, they were on this side of that building. The other side was the Maslin Merchants or the, Mer the old Ohio Merchants Trust Company. And uh, those pillars. Now I've read this that those four pillars across the front were all one-piece pillars. And later on, of course, they took those down and covered it all up with nice big pieces of marble it makes it look like a box the house right next house right next to it there that's where Bechtel live and uh, he was an old man here in town it wasn't just a little bit odd and he'd go to church he was supposed to be an Episcopalian but he seemed to go an awful lot to the Methodist Church where I went and when we see him in there we'd all get over kids would try to get over around him because he was always amen and all through the church services until mother and father would wake up to what was happening and then we didn't get over there anymore. The building in back of it is the old Bamberlin Piano Factory that's in back of there and that was torn down later on and joined to this building of the first savings and loan. That stood right where it does today. This was originally built by the Union National Bank. They were down on South Erie Street and they moved up here and built this building because the First National was going to build that big building at the end of Erie Street and Lincoln Way. And uh, it was later on was bought, well, after the Depression, it was bought by the uh, State Bank, and it was kept that way until the new owners came in. And uh, you can see the buildings over there to the left. That today is the parking lot for the bank. But there was those beautiful columns again, and I knew Mr. McLean in there. Austin McLean and I were very good friends. Matter of fact, I lived on Welmer Street, and he lived on Pine. And every time we come downtown, we'd always go in and say hello to Mr. McLean. And then right beside him, in the next bank or next desk, was Jay Lester, who was the assistant cashier there. And Mr. McLean was the cashier of the bank. Old Mr. Hunt was the president of the company. There was a father and son were presidents of two of the big banks here in Masson. Mr. Hunt Sr. was president of this bank, the Union National Bank. His son was president of the First National Bank. And they were very prominent people here in Maslin's history. That is a lovely building, but they've turned it, well, they just covered it all up with brick, and it looks like the Dickens. This is Duncan's second home. No, no, his third home. And it was uh, built right now, and it's part of the museum. It's where the, uh, the present Massa Museum is in the whole second floor. And uh, this half of the first floor plus the hallway, that is the Massa Museum. The basement is also part of that Massa Museum. And I remember this distinctly, not like just like that. It was improved a little bit, but uh, this was a beautiful building. Now, I know I heard this story when I was a kid. That that's right out on the sidewalk, as you know, when you walk by there. And uh, he owned the land up and down the street, and he said that he, uh, I'm positive I remember there was a balcony on this side of that house, but it doesn't show it there. But uh, he said that there's nobody could build out in front of him in his town so he could look up and down Main Street without any obstructions of any kind. This is, the, this is the way the home was when it was presented to the Massa Museum and the library. Beautiful building, really was given to Maslin. It was a masterpiece to be given to Maslin. And it stood right where it stands today, and along with all that land that the library and the museum is on was part of the 
original Duncan estate. Well, Duncan more than like had a lot more land than that because his barn stood up on the north, uh, no, on the southwest corner of uh, 3rd and Federal. Stood there until not too many years ago when they took it down. Gordon Heller had to take it down to make parking lot up there. But uh, that's, that's a very, very beautiful building. It was given the will to the Massa Museum when Mrs. Duncan died, or Mrs. Baldwin died. Carl, do you uh, remember when it wasn't painted? Or has it always been I painted? I always think that it has been painted, but I'm not really, I was not sure enough to make a statement on that. Okay. It's the old soft brick. Walker Wright. Now his picture was in the Independent just within the last month. Did you see that picture in there? Yeah. All right. Now Walker Wright was a slave down in Georgia, and when Sherman went through Georgia with his army, why Walker Wright, like a lot of the people from the South, slaves, joined the army and went with it, and he took the name of the owner of the property where he lived, which was Wright. And that's how he took. The, he became Mr. Walker Wright was because he took the name of his owner. He went over to went to Georgia and then finally ended up in New York. And while he was in New York, Kent Jarvis met him and talked to him and brought him to Masson as his yard man. And he had a home down on South Erie Street at that time that needed a yard man. And uh, either he, he was leaving town or he was getting up in years. I'm not sure which, but anyhow. He talked to um, Mr. Burton about him taking uh, Walker Wright into his employment up there, which he did, which was up on the corner of 4th and uh, Lincoln Way East. And he worked there until he died. Now, he was the nicest old man you ever met in your life. He always had that plug hat on there. He would be working out in the yard, cutting grass, digging. He'd have his plug hat on. He also had a frock coat. He didn't use that when he was working in the yard, but he did have his plug hat on the head most of the time out in the yard. And he was there until he died. And I know that uh, he went down to, uh, this is an article that was in the Independent years ago. I think it was back about 30, 1930, something along there. He died in 1929, 21, but he went down to Tuskegee, Alabama to the Tuskegee uh, Institute. And down there, why well, he was so taken by that, that he left his money, all but a small amount of it, he left to the Tuskegee uh, Institution. And uh, $40,000 he left. Now that man never made over, I don't see how he could ever make $10 a week, really I don't, but just the same, that's the amount he left. And he gave to the, he was Episcopalian, and he said he was like Booker T. Washington. He says, when somebody comes along and you find a colored man, anything but a Baptist or a Methodist, somebody's been messing with his religion. And he was an Episcopalian. He gave to the Episcopalian church, he gave to the Red Cross, and he gave a few donations to other things around here. But the, the $40,000 he left to the Tuskegee, Alabama College. <laughs> and that is in their own information in their own yearbook. That was the last place that uh, Walker Wright, Wright Walker, lived in. And he was a yard man there, and I can remember him. We'd come down, I lived up at the end of Welma Street, and we'd walk down Main Street or Lincoln Way, and we'd see him working out in the yard. We'd always cross over the street and say hello to him and talk to him, because I say he was a delightful old person that you just didn't want to pass without saying hello to him. Along with that time, you kids never walk by homes with the people sitting out on the porch without saying, how do you do, and tip your hat, and keep on going down the street. And they always answered you. It was just one of those things that was a nice, nice setup. At any rate, uh, that's where he lived. Now, this home was built by the Wellmans. And again, now there's more history connected to this building when you think about it, the time. The oldest, the one daughter of his, was a, a very fine pianist, and she decided to go out to Seattle where she was going to teach music. And she had, she was a free spirit. And she went out there, and she married some man out there, and anyhow, so they had a son. And uh, later on, why uh, he died, and she 
I don't know where she went down to San Francisco. She, I forget where she went to, but there she married a man by the name of London. And London adopted her son. And that is Jack London's mother was born in that house right there. Now that was kind of unknown around Madison for years. But since then, why there's been people coming in from all over the country to get a picture of the home of what London descended from. But, uh, of course, the home is now gone. That was torn down in, uh, I'm guessing, in the 1950s. Where is it located exactly? Located on the northeast corner of uh, 4th and Lincoln Way East. By the way, that stone the stone block is a lot of stone uh, balls on I think it's still there. It's where the mass under that motel or that hotel is. Oh, it was a really a handsome place. I was there was Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Johns who uh, lived beside us up on 11th Street there, and she was sitting beside me the night I showed these pictures up at the Women's Club, and she says, uh, she said, you know, she said I went, I knew when they built that porch. Well, at that time I didn't, I thought that porch was part of the original house. I said, oh, Mrs. Johns, you don't remember that? She says, well, I do. I said, Mrs. Johns, there's nobody that old. I knew her quite well. I said, well, I am. And that shut me up right then and there. <laughs> okay, we're rolling now. Uh, uh, all right. Now, the first tray that we, we, the tray we've just finished was 1A. There were two things in there that I should have mentioned when I was showing that, and I neglected it. The one was a picture from the top of the standpipe. Uh, I showed these pictures to the directors of the first savings and loan. Now, this is when I was first starting my picture, showing them. And uh, I, I showed that picture up there, and Junie Shinocko was in the group, and he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, there's more outhouses than houses on that picture. And uh, some of these old timers that were on that uh, board of directors, they, old Junie, but uh, that's the way he was. And uh, then the other one on the Wellman House out on Lincoln Way East, that was on the corner of the 4th and uh, Lincoln Way, that was uh, raised in 1940, uh, 1954. So those are notations should be on that tray one. 1A, actually. All right. Uh, now this is t tray 1B. And that is James Duncan. James Duncan came to Masson as a 26-year-old man, already had been a very, very successful uh, shipmaster. And uh, he came into town with quite a bit of money, and he looked around, and he decided he was going to stay here. And his wife was the one that named Masson Masson for the Catholic uh, bishop in France, whose ministers' uh, works were very, very familiar and were read all over the United States. And this is a funny thing. I, we went through, uh, I think it was Hawthorne's home, up in uh, where he had lived at one time, up in uh, Concord, Massachusetts. And they found in back in the, in the uh, when they tore the house down or when they did some remodeling up there, they ran across this letter of a note that he had written. And he said he had just finished writing the, the uh, reading the works of uh, Bishop Maslin, and he says he did some beautiful work. So at any rate, uh, he was considered the, the outstanding speaker of France at that time. James Duncan came to Mass, as I say, as a young man in 1916, or 1816, and uh, he immediately fell in love with the place, and uh, his first home was down on the Mass State Hospital grounds. And he lived there for a few years. Then he came up to the where the Lincoln Theater stands today, and uh, he built a home there. Now there's no real pictures of that, but there is a uh, a pen a pen drawing picture of it that I have somewhere in my collection. His third uh, third home was up where the Massa Museum is today, and he built that in uh, 1830 35, I think it is. And he lived there till he left Maslin. All right, this is Maslin's Union School, and the 100 years of education in Maslin was based from this school up to date. This was built in 1848. And I know that uh, 
I, I showed me, they asked me to show my pictures to the football team and it was an evening meeting and I went down and I showed the pictures and uh, I said that uh, during my talking there I said now this was Madison's first segregated school well you never heard a room get so quiet in your life because you know there was quite a few colored boys on the football team and I didn't mean that I didn't mean it at all but what I did mean was that they broke up the classes by grades and age like the first grade the second third and fourth grade and that was it and they came from the biggest part of the United States to see how this school was laid out we had a lot of publicity at that time all right they used this up then to 1879 when they built the North Street School which was really a beautiful school that's it and uh, that, that's a, a beautiful that's a masterpiece and uh, I know when I transferred from Lincoln School up there why uh, I went up there into the sixth grade and the tower was off at that time now that uh, that was they were beginning to build schools all over town and when you think about them building that school then and we can't even get a school pass today after the uh, the school that we have has been there since 1914 and we tore that down in 1923 this was a high school. It was built, it started school in here in 1914. And uh, we've added on, added on, and even when I was there in the early 20s, why, uh, they, they, had out, they had buildings around the outside on the yard, which was uh, portable buildings for schools, classes. This is Main Street, or Lincoln. I keep calling it Main Street because it was Main Street to me for years. The Lincoln Way East, and you can see the building that you're very familiar with is the old Masson building, or the old McClymus building, which is now called the Masson building. And down at the end there, at the end of the street, where you see there's a canal bridge, and you'll just see the head of a streetcar showing coming over that bridge. It had a little hump in it, and that hump was so that the canal boats could go under it. And there was a lot of pictures taken, especially east from that particular building, and they would take up through the hill. Well, what happened there? Did I hit that? Must have. Hey, would you want him to pause his story while you get the next slide ready, or would you like to do the last time? Or not? What's that? We were wondering whether we should, uh, whether we should stop. Okay. Uh, this is Lincoln Way East. Now, these pictures were taken about 1914. These are off postcards. The large building down there at the middle of the picture, that is the McClamas building, which was built in 1908 or 1909, they finished it. And uh, it was a very big building in Masson at that time. The buildings on the right are a picture I showed you in the, one of the very first pictures I showed you, and that was this group of buildings, these four buildings to the right here, were in that picture that was built around 1852 to 55. And you can see on the top there, right under the, all the decorations of the top on the first two down there, you'll see those same marks that are <coughs> were on that building as you saw at that time. And as a matter of fact, they're there to this day. They're also on this fourth building up here. In between, uh, Conrad has completely changed the front of his, uh, his building. And the next one, that was changed, and that's where Duncan is today. Also, if you look down there at the extreme end, you'll see the streetcar just coming up over the hump of the, uh, did I have that in before? A hump, a streetcar coming up over the canal, uh, canal bridge so that there was a hump there so that the canal boats could go under it. Next. Now, Masson and Vice Industries, this sign was put up in 1912, and it was certainly was a big deal because I know Mother and Father brought me down here as a kid to see them light that, uh, that sign. And I have the names of all those people, but I can't tell you now what their names are. I know one of them is uh, Fred Justice, and another one is uh, Ju uh, Fred Justice, and... The one in the middle is the Mary Masson. That is uh, Wise, Jake Wise. The other two I can't, the other rest of them I can't come to right this minute. That was built in 1912, and it was there until 
they uh, well they took the letters off quite a long time after that and then finally just the frame was up and they took the frame down I think shortly before they put the viaduct or of course this is covered with the viaduct now and I don't know whether the story is true or not but uh, uh, Mr. D uh, or Mr. Anthony came through on a train from Chicago and he saw that sign and he said I'm going to build my plant right to build, bring my plant right here to Mass and that was the beginning of the uh, Mass of Steel castings I never could check that out for sure whether he said it or not. It's a rumor. Now, everybody knows where that picture is because there's a standpipe, and I'm just plain sick about this standpipe being gone. But uh, this is this is the uh, the one green. They had two greens there. They had the uh, what they call the Union Green and the Charity Green, and this one is the uh, let me see. This one's the Union Green. And uh, the home on the extreme right was where Alexander Skinner lived, and he built he built that home out of the first brick home built in Kendall, and the brick was made right here in their brickyard, right down about the end of North Street. And it was a very successful place. I know that uh, Duncan was there, lived there for a short time during the building one of his homes, and uh, when the news came through that the canal would be on the side of the, the Tuscarawas River, Henry William Henry wanted to have it on the other side of the Tuscarawas River. He was a very powerful man in Masson at that time. But Duncan won, and it came through on this side. And by the way, William Henry's great-granddaughter was the wife of Herbert Hoover, a president of Mass, or president of the United States. Now this is one of the Crocs and Keatons, and this is called the French model, that had that sloping hood on there, and also was called the uh, 35 uh, HP. And uh, this was taken on Charles Street, looking directly east. You can't recognize any of the buildings on either side, but it was taken about in front of the the old fire station. And look at that headlight and those tires would be something to take off. You couldn't take rims off at that time. You had to take the tires off that wheel and put them back on the wheel if you had any problem with tires. Masson's uh, City Car Barns. Now this was on Lincoln Way East and up just about where, uh, well, that's just east of Wales Road and on the north side of the street. And it stood there... Uh, well, just about the first building. It was, well, no, there was a building. There was a home on the corner. That's where uh, Dr. Hogue lived. And then the next one was the car barns. And on uh, November, I think it was November the 16th, 1916. I'm not sure about that November part, the date of it, but uh, the 1916, I'm sure of. That the car barns caught on fire and they burned down. And we were at the Lincoln Theater, the movie that night. And coming home, why, we saw the confusion up here, and we come a-running up, but we're too late. The fire was out. But then they moved out to close to where the Meadows uh, Shopping Center is right now, and that place is still standing. Mrs. Richard's houseboat. Start over. Okay. Five. All right. Mrs. Richard's houseboat. That's where she lived. And that she lived in that room. I don't know don't, that boat. I don't know how long, but she lived there until the 1913 flood, and that came through, and it just floated her houseboat right out and took it right down, crashed it into the uh, canal bridge, and uh, this uh, the houseboat was completely demolished. The bridge was uh, had to be rebuilt, but uh, that was the end of her home here, and that was on the east side of the canal, south of Cherry Street. This was a picture taken by Charlie Geist. Charlie Geist was a local druggist, and uh, he was a very, very famous man around town. He was taking pictures all the time. Some of them were not so good. As he said, he was experimenting, and he could only do it on Sundays because otherwise, why, well, he was working. Now, this picture is taken facing south, or hold it, hold it, hold it, northwest. 
And uh, the white building that stands up there, the strongest in the picture, that is where Cornell has his real estate office now, which is on the northeast corner of Lincoln Way and Erie Street. Now, his picture is entitled, uh, I think it's two inner urbans and five or six city cars and a mail truck at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And you can tell by the size of the cars which ones are which. This was where uh, Sears, where later, uh, later on this building was torn down for Sears store. In there, Warren Russell for running for Congress. And the cars, as you can see around there, this picture was had to be taken in the 1920s. All right, they, this was the McClyman's building. That's the way it was originally. Now, I don't ever remember seeing it like that. It's, uh, on, if you look at today, you'll see there's another bay. It goes all the way up the west side there. And if you look at it from the west, and you can see it from the west, it only goes back about 25 feet. But they did have three bays in the front. There was, uh, originally, there was a... Uh, um, uh, the Merchants National Bank there on the corner, and then there was Woolworths, and the next store over there was, well, in back of it was the, hum the uh, Humburger store. They built that uh, part on, and then they enlarged the first floor all the way back, and Humburgers were in there, and they went straight back, and they joined on to the building in back of it, and that became Humburgers, which was quite a good-sized store at that time. It was one of Masson leading department stores. And there's, there's a store. There's a store that they joined on to in back of it. This is before they did that. That's when the building was first built. And this building was built, I think it was 1885. And the Masson Post Office moved up to the last building, up there to the last store room, up there to the right. That's where they were located. <coughs> <coughs> and you can look in back of that, on each side, and you can see the canal comes right down in back of that particular building. Uh, in 1906, uh, the Bance livery stable had a fire, and they, they all the horses that were lost that were pulling the mail truck, the mail uh, trucks or mail wagons around on the outskirts of Maslin. And Crox and Keaton was making automobiles at that time, and they brought these these automobiles up to the post office and tried to sell them on using their cars to deliver mail. Now, we have all of the mailmen named. I have all of those, but the drivers, we don't have any of them named. And at any rate, the, the, uh, the, the post office wouldn't buy the cars. They went back to the horse and buggies again. Those are Crocs and Keaton's? Crocs and Keaton. It doesn't look like the other ones do. Oh, no, this is, this is an earlier one <laughs> than that. And by the way, the Crocs and Keaton's was building was down there where the Masson Cleveland Akron Sign Company is today, which is on the northwest corner of uh, First Street and Walnut Street, southwest. <laughs> this is Lincoln Way West, looking right straight across town. And by the way, you can see right on the skyline there, on the line with these telephone posts on the right, you can see the tower of the Methodist Church. So we know that it was after, uh, it was around 1900, something of that time, that this car line went down through here. Now on this side of the river was the B&O and the Wheeling. On the other side of the river was the Pennsylvania. And you could make a bet with anybody in town here and tell them they couldn't get up to here and up to the forks up here, which was Main Street and Lincoln Way West, 
and get back across town again without getting caught by a railroad train some way or another because they were going through here all the time, day in and day out, night time, right straight through. This is one of my favorite stories. I'm going to tell you the whole story on this. In uh, 1918, I decided I was going to get a job, and I hunted all over town for a job, and I just didn't find a thing. So I went home. I told my dad what I was trying to do. He said, well, now, listen, if you really want to work and you'll promise not to fool around, he said, I can get you a job as a mailboy down at the wrestling company. And, boy, I jumped at that. So I went down to the wrestling company, and I was hired immediately, of course, and uh, I got 10 cents an hour. And I worked 10 hours a day for five days a week and a half a day on Saturday. And the, uh, I worked that whole summer. And then I went back to school when school started. And in the fall, why, uh, the flu band hit Massel. And it closed up everything. They closed all the churches, all the theaters, anything of that type at all. The only thing that was left open were, I don't know whether all the, sc- the grocery stores were open or not, and the factories. Other than that, there was just nothing open around the town. So uh, Father said, well, I was moping around the house, and Father said, well, if you want to go down and work as a mail boy, you can, because he's home with the flu. So I went down, and I worked all that particular time. One of my jobs after I made my daily morning route of the mail was to go up to Bert Hankins' cigar store and get Mr. Hagem's Pittsburgh Dispatch paper. And uh, I would go up there and get it, turn right around and come back down again. And what I would give to have a picture of that alligator he had in a big tank. And that originally was just a small alligator, but it finally got to be a doggone big alligator in that tank right in his front window. So uh, at any rate, uh, this one time, because this is on my way back after my first round, my Mr. Hegum said, I wanted to know what was going on. I said, well, I couldn't tell him anything at all. I said, I know that the whistles are blowing and the bells are ringing but I said other than that I don't know but he says go up and get my Pittsburgh dispatch and then you can take the rest of the day off well boy that was the fastest flight in history and so I went up there and got his his Pittsburgh dispatch had been sold by some mistake of some kind and I brought him back a plain dealer to me a paper was a paper and Mr. Hagen opened that up just sat right there opened it up and took it and threw it right in the wastebasket and scared the life out of me and told me to get out of there, which I did. And I got out in the out, outer office while there was Johnny Williams over there. He was a good-sized fat man. Back in the corner was Mr. Kinney, and they wanted to know what happened, and I told them, and Mr. Uh, Williams, he just laid right over his desk and started to laugh, and I could still see him, just his stomach just rolling back and forth as he was laughing, and Mr. Kinney back in the corner was a quiet man, and he was laughing too. So... Uh, Mr. Williams told me to get out of there. He knew I was supposed to take the rest of the day off, which I did. In the meantime, I'd brought back the word that the war was over. And uh, I went uptown and watched all the excitement. I went home. When I got home, my father and mother were sitting there, and they were laughing. And I knew very well they were laughing over that paper, and I wanted to know what it was, and they wouldn't tell me. So uh, at any rate, when father went back to work, why, uh, mother said, well, now listen, I'll tell you, but don't you dare tell your dad I did. He says, you took him a Democrat paper, and there was never a word of truth ever written in a Democrat paper. <laughs> so I'll never forget that as long as I live. And uh, at any rate, the war was not over. That was the fake uh, armistice. Now, there is their thrashing uh, division. You see, they had two divisions, the thrasher and the engine. Now, this was the engines that pulled the thrasher from farm to farm. And some of these people, they had, they bought the, the uh, owned the thrasher and owned the uh, engines, and they would drag these around. They would have a special time to go. And uh, my father was superintendent of the thrashing division under Mr. Hagem, who was the general superintendent. Now uh, this is the parade, a get-together parade on that first day. Yeah.
think there's one of those uh, outfits that still works, but they aren't using it anymore. And that's out on the Force Knot Farm, out on uh, 27th Street, just at uh, about 12th Street. Boy, that's a beautiful picture. Oh. Now this. This is a group of people that just got together in March. The war was over. This was on that same afternoon. Now, by the way, that was on November the seventh. That was on a Thursday. And uh, they were marching all over town. You can see it wasn't very well organized. There was just a group of people up there marching around. And it turned out later that that was the fake Armistice Day. Matter of fact, we knew it that night. Now, on the, uh, what, uh, by the way, the flu ban was canceled then uh, after that particular weekend. And we went back to school on November the 11th, which was on a Monday. And uh, it wasn't very long after we got there that uh, the, you never heard such a racket in your life. There was uh, bells ringing, whistles blowing, and automobiles running around the streets there, and they were backfiring their cars. I wonder how many of them lost, lost uh, mufflers on that because they really made an awful lot of racket. And anyhow, the teachers seemed to know that there was no use trying to keep weak kids in school, so they let school out that particular day. And we went downtown, and that time, why the, the parade was better organized. Now uh, here is, you saw that uh, the engines, the steam uh, motors, steam, uh, steam uh, engines that they had originally to pull the, tra the trash thrashers around for Russells, and that, that's when they tried to compete with some of the new ones. That is a gasoline motor there. See, see I've, I've got to go to the John. Is there one place around here and there? Oh, shouldn't have been. Turn it off. Uh, now just pull that lever out on the side there. And this is the Red Cross workers. Now these were the women that worked up in the Mass and Social Club, which was up on the corner of Fourth and uh, Federal on the southwest corner. And that was the Mass and Social place where they... Uh, had dances and dinners and things of that type for the people that were members of that club. And these uh, these women here worked during the war making bandages and things of that type for the armed services. Later on this was the nucleus of the Mass and Women's Club. Peerless Drawn Steel. A lot of people around town have forgotten all about the Peerless Drawn Steel. That was the originator, or the place where the Union Drawn Steel now stands, down on Sipple. And uh, it is, as you can see, this is a real Armistice Day parade. They have their truck all decorated, and they're out to celebrate. This is Cherry Roch School, and the money was left by Cherry Roch to build that particular school, and she wanted, I should have looked this up, but I think she wanted was eight students a year or ten students a year, and they had four grades there, and uh, they'd be both boys and girls. Now, this was built on the, the Wales Farm, which is now called Cherry Roch. And I shouldn't have said Wales Farm because it was between Wales Road and Amherst Road, north of Lake Street. And it was, <coughs> they sent to put students in there, and they went there from 1840, I think it's 45 or 40, it's along in 1845, up to around 1901, when they just seemed to run out of money and they closed the school. About that time, Summit County come down and they leased the school and they sent their uh, uh, boys and girls from up in Akron down here to go to this same school, which they did. And they went there till 1924 when they closed it. We had one of the boys graduating in our class that was uh, graduating that last class there, the name was Sammy Forbes. 
and uh, he lived in that. Now that was a, a good sized farm. Now that was to have the boys were to learn farming and working on the outside, anything to do with outside labor. The girls were supposed to li learn housewifery, and uh, they were taught that way in there. Now this picture was taken from the tower, looking directly southwest, and that street that you're seeing run crossways there, that is Lake Street. There are a couple of those homes that are still, st both of those homes are all still standing as you see there. And that's 11th Street that runs down there that it looks like a track, and that's what it is. No, it isn't, because 11th Street is where that, uh, between those two houses over there, that brick house on the right side, or left side, and the uh, white house on the left side, or, where did I get my directions right? The brick house is on the left side, the right, the white house is on the right side of 11th and Lake, and they are both still standing. And the uh, 11th Street come right down in the extension of that particular road. This picture was taken in the 1890s. Now you'll notice that building, white building on the right, that's where the beehive was at that time. That was Maslin, uh, Beehive and Humburgers were the two leading department stores in Maslin at that particular time. And uh, they were in there. The, the, the dark building over there was the, uh, well that was a hotel, and also there was a clothing store in there. And uh, it was ca called the Whitman Block at that time. Later on, it was uh, where the West End Theater stood, so that'll give you an idea of where it was uh, for we people that remember the West End Theater. This is a street fair. They used to have a great many of these around town. They would have them about every year, and they'd have a parade, and then they would have that fair would be up on Tremont Street between Erie and uh, up to about Erie and the Second Street, and they would have things built all along the side up through there. Having the faintest idea. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, wait till I get it back again. What's the matter? There's a sticking up at the other end, I'll bet you. Pull those, yeah, pull those slides in. This is the other end of that particular block. Now, see, there's the canal bridge. Oh. Now, the the be uh, the, the Beehive Fire, which was in 1899, went from First Street southwest or northwest up to the canal, and that took out every building where now the First National Bank stands. Every building in there was wiped out back to the, to uh, federal again and it was a complete wipeout this uh, this building on the right or the left side there went along with those now you can see that there's a hump in the canal bridge see that uh, streetcar going up over that hump right there now there's actually the beehive fire and it was a tremendous fire it just wiped out everything in that block from first street up to the canal and back to Federal on Lincoln Way. And that's the equipment we had to fight fire with at that time. Now they would take that hose and they'd throw it into any place where there was water, it'd be a well or a canal or a creek. Of course here they had the canal to get into. And uh, then they would have a pumper that was along there that would pump that water and they got a fair stream but it was only about a three to four inch hose. So it was kind of a losing battle. There's a beehive as it was. It started up in about 1901, and it was on that. Uh, and see, all those buildings that are in there are new. They're after the beehive fire. The beehive had the big building, and then the other two, there was a Pilly building and also a, um, what the dickens was that lady's name? 
Mrs. Gao, she owned part of that too. And uh, but Massa at that time, this was the leading department store in Massa was the Beehive. Humburgers was around here also, but they uh, their building was old. It wasn't anything like this one. This is the window glass factory. Yep. Yeah. This is a window glass factory in in Mass, and they've stood down on the south side of Walnut Street, and uh, on the uh, between. Now there's the river they're going to see here in the front. That's the river. It's between the canal and the river, and up on that skyline there. Do you see this one tower up there? It's just above the uh, how the uh, skyline. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the old St. Joseph Church. Yes, way up, well, no, not the extreme left. It's about halfway up there. We don't have it yet there. There it is, there it is. That's St. Joseph's Church, and uh, that's taken, of course, from the clear over on where uh, these Massons, uh, well, it isn't there any longer, where Silks had their paper factory. And there you see the railroad track coming across from the window glass from that was uh can't think of the name of that company either. Whether it began with a W and the second name was Wells. The first one was W two, that was nuts. No, that isn't right. Anyhow, that's uh, that was a window glass factory and it stood between the uh, the canal and the river and on the south side of Walnut Street. Now, nobody can visualize something like this. This is how we had to listen to football, baseball games, and price fights. We go down to the old independent, not where they are now, but where they just moved from. And there'd be some man stand up there over that arch and had a doorway there. He had a megaphone. And he would call out and tell us exactly what was going on. And uh, I can't tell you what kind of, what type of weather it was because there's fellas in overcoats and there's a man in shirt sleeves. I think it must be in the fall, so it could possibly be a World Series or it might have been a price fight. I don't think it could have been a football game. Oh, it is a possibility. Uh, Jim McCormick used to stand up there. I can remember him as a kid. He would stand up there and he'd call out exactly what was going on. That's the end of that one. All right, the first building on the left is uh, Henrik's Grocery Store. And that's been there for years. As a matter of fact, there's our delivery wagon out in front of the house there, or store. And at that time, they used to all deliver their own their own groceries to their own customers. Next was a saloon, and next you've got the Conrad Hotel. Now, right down here on the extreme left, you see that wagon there. That's not the not the buggy, but next to the buggy is a wagon there, and that was a fish wagon. And uh, that man sold fish right there on the corner. And I know I saw different articles in the Independent, especially in Do You Remember When. And that's something they have dropped from the independent that sh we should make them, force them to put that back in again. Uh, it's, uh, there was an article in there about uh, the women of the town were very, very upset about that fish. He would scrape his fish off and those scales would fall all over the sidewalk. And their skirts at that time would go down to the street, down to the sidewalk, and they'd come along and go home with a whole skirt full of scales, of fish scales on their dresses. All right, there's the Pennsylvania Railroad Station at that time. That was quite a busy place then. Down here in the uh, the beginning, right in front of us here, is a cannon. That was called Battery Wetzel. And uh, whenever it started, they would wait until that thing would shoot, and you could hear it all over town. And when they did that, everybody knew the parade was going to start. And uh, right next there, where those flowers are growing, originally that was a fish pond. Keep going. Okay. 
All right, now this is a roundhouse, Pennsylvania roundhouse, that stood between the Penn Road and the Pennsylvania uh, Railroad track. And right ahead of us is Old Third Street, which at that time was called Lincoln Avenue. And uh, I know I had been to Sunday school, and they said the world was going to come to an end with hell, fire, and damnation. And we lived right up on the corner of 4th and South Street then. This was in 1914, and we moved away from there in December of 14. Why, uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning, I don't know, none of, nobody was up at the house at the time, why, I heard this awful hissing and rumbling and the falling of, of course, it was the falling of bricks. But what had happened, one of the trains going through there had hit a prop, and the whole building just caved right down. You could see some in the tender of that car ahead there. And the whole, whole roundhouse just caved right in. But uh, that really scared the daylights out of me. The building there with the awning in front of it, that was old Russ's grocery store, was there for years. And the other side of it was the Want Saloon. This is the Franklin home, the Franklin Hotel. Now that stood on First Street Southwest, originally called Canal Street. And uh, this was taken from Abel Fletcher's third floor studio, looking west. Now anybody on the west side, you see how heavily populated that was over there at that time. We have to guess on when this picture was taken. We say in around the 1850s. It was built in 1821, and it was there until it was torn down in 1922, I think it was torn down. Uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Webb was the first manager there of that hotel, and then he left from there and went to New York and Philadelphia managing hotels. All right, now this is um, a main street. This is a parade. You see that? Sorry. No parade could start without Mr. Gordon riding down there on his horse. And that was the Gordon of Gordon and Hollinger Shinocko Funeral Home. He had a beautiful horse, and he sat it very straight, and he would ride right downtown. Again, guessing at this picture, that automobile across the street there, I would say it was in its late, late teens. And there's the old McClamas building to the right, or what's today called the Masson building. The Wellmans came to Maslin in around 19, er, 18, 20, uh, 24, 25, something like that, 26. They do, came, I think they must have come right after the canal was built, which was around 26. And uh, they built these warehouses right on the side of the canal. That was built on the east side of the canal. Now, on that, they came here at that time, and they sold the, at, the warehouses to the Atwaters, who ran it then till they tore it down in 32 or 33. And this was quite a place. This is a 1904 flood, another big flood in Maslin. That's a Schuster home on the other side of the street. And Can you hold that in the screen? Beg pardon? Can you hold that in the screen? Do you have any more information about the Schuster Brewery? What do you remember about it? Anything? No. Uh, it was it started up around 1900 and it lasted through the uh, well prohibition from that time on it was kind of just going downhill it was never I don't think it was ever used much after that I don't remember that really Where was it located, exactly? that was on uh, third street northwest and as a matter of fact that's road you can go down that road yet and go uh, I see. Yes, you can go past that, and then it curves around in back of the shopping center there. Where Town Plaza. Is. Yes, right. Goes around Town Plaza, and now the old building, the building, the home back there used to be called the Oriole Club. Now a lot of people around Massa remember the old Oriole Club. Do you remember that, that's, Bill? That's what this uh, house is. That's that house that turned into the Oriole it's Club. Right along in there, yes. Mm -hmm. That was on the west side of, or east side of Third Street. By the way, when you see a picture with those pins that holding the sides of the pictures down, you know Ray Selvis took those. 
he, he took a lot of slides, copied a lot of pictures from me and put on slides. And that's one of them that he copied down. And it was, the picture was curling, so he put the glass on there. This was built by Maslin Men as an athletic club. And uh, it was built around 1906. It had a swimming pool in the basement. The first floor was a running track, a basketball court. Had all kinds of equipment there. Then they had a running track up on the second floor there that you could just run all the way around there and look right down on the basketball court. Uh, they used that till about 19, about 1914. Why are we, you know, back a little bit farther than that. I'd say right 1912. When the high school bought it, as their gymnasium and they kept it and they put it up for sale in 1916. Now the home that's in front of theirs is Dr. Metz's office. Dr. Metz was possibly the most famous eye surgeons in the biggest part of the United States at that time. He, they, people came from all over the country to have him remove cataracts which was comparatively new and he had his office right there and but it wasn't standing there it was a little bit to the left and they moved that over in front of the building as the office to the building. Now this was taken from Welma Street. Now the home on the extreme left there is Keckner's home. And he built that, that's a stone block home. Now you, people, some people won't remember that, others will. That's where uh, the Bernsteins lived afterwards, and uh, Dr. Hyde was the last one to live in there. And it was right on the corner of 3rd and uh, Tremont Street on the northwest corner. That next home down there is the old, uh, great Scott, I can't think of their name now. And then way down that brick building, way down at the end there, that's the Siler Hotel or the Tremont House. Finally ended the one to, the one to, the right. to the left. That's the Tremont House. The one to the right is a stone building. That's still standing there. That's where the Masons meet today. By the way, that white building in the center of the picture that was built by the Swanson Brothers. I, they did not have that board fence around there at any time that I remember of. By the way, there's one thing there. You notice down right at the bottom of the picture. That's an outside toilet of the old, uh, well, the school, it's the, the primary school. It stood on the corner of uh, the northeast corner of uh, what is today 3rd Street and Tremont, southeast. And uh, that was a school. That was built as a school, and it was a school until, or I don't know, it was around 1870, something like that, 1870 or 75, when they built Lincoln School. Parade, circus parades, you always had circus parades in Masson. They would come in, they'd get in at, well, it was just about daybreak when they'd come here. The people would go down by the hundreds. I went down a couple of times and watched them unload those, uh, the, pre uh, the, the wagons, the animals. You could hear them roaring away in there and take the elephants. And they, the uh, circuses were set up on the what's called the golf course. It's where the boys' club is today. Now they would come down Tremont Street and come north on First Street and then go west on Lincoln Way and back back up to their headquarters. Look at the people come down, how anxious they were. This had to be in the early 20s. That time there was nothing else going on. You just uh, you had to make your own excitement. And that was it. When a circus came to town, they were a sellout. That's over where the boys' club is today. That's where they. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the best for circus in town. That was what they used to call the golf course. As I understand it, and I think I'm right on this, that was uh, <coughs> Walter. Uh, oh, great Scott. The man that built the women's club. McClyman's. That was Walter McClyman's private golf clubs. Uh, of course, back there in the late 1800s. I know when I showed this picture the first time, I showed them to a bunch of school kids, and boy, they all screamed at me, pollution, pollution. I said, well, that isn't pollution, that's steam. 
I don't know if I got away with it or not, but I said that. And again, look at the crowd that was down there to see a circus parade. This is in the middle of the day. Uh, this is Becker's uh, grocery store, and this is on uh, Area Street North. The man there with a the plug hat, that is Bobby, uh, Bobby Folger. Now you're going to, Bobby Folger was a very important man in Maslin's history. He was a mayor of Maslin twice. He's a very prominent attorney. And uh, his father was a sea captain uh, sailing out of uh, Nantucket. And he's the one that first found the survivors of the mutiny on the Bonnie. You know, they went to an island there and they burned all of their ships so that nobody could go away and tell where they were. At that time, the only ones that were left were just young kids. There, no, there was nobody there to go down and get them or anything like that because they had nothing to do with it. Just the descendants of the original ones that did that. Uh, there's uh, Mr. Becker over there, to right to the right there of the entrance of the store. Where was this located? Uh, that was on uh, North Erie Street, and it was back about, uh, well, there'd be a shoe store in there today. Or there was at one time. In back of the uh, where Cornell's building is, and it's be about the first or second building in back of Cornell's building. The, the, there's your Schuster Brewery again. Hmm? This is from Postcard. When you see color back in those days, why well, you know that's taken from a postcard. And uh, that was really beautifully kept up. These factories around town, the grass was cut, and everything was kept up very beautifully. Now, this was on 3rd Street, Northwest, and it was there until they tore it down piecemeal. The last thing to go was the ice house. <laughs> Look at those horses. Now, that is how they used to deliver. Uh, beer. They deliver in kegs. And uh, on that, the, the driver would get out. They were always big husky men. Those drivers were. Now, a great many of them would carry a keg of elk or carry a big, right? <laughs> a barrel of beer right into the saloon. They put it on their shoulder and carry it right in. Others would have to roll it in. They also had a great big, about a three inch thick straw mat. It was woven. They'd put that on the ground. They'd drop these kegs right down on the ground, and then they'd pick them up there or roll them in from there. Maybe the ones that carried them in, maybe they didn't put them on the ground. I don't know. That was, this is one of my classics here. This is Swarm's Grocery Store. And uh, there's the, the men, there's Mr. Schantz on the left there. And I know I sold him a carpet when he was 94 years old. I was over at R&J. And they said, we don't want to take that on a 98 charge. That's what the girls in the office said. They said, he may not live that long. I said, don't you worry about how long he's going to live. So they went ahead, of course, and took it. And a matter of fact, a couple of years later, there was a piece in the paper mass on here that he was going to go take a trip over to Switzerland, where he was from. Now, this is a picture right there. The Swarm grocery store stood there, was there as far back as I remember. Later on, that became, uh, mm, the Dickens of those boys' names. They had, there's still one of their name, one of their grocery stores out on Tremont, or on the, uh, Walnut Road out there. And uh, they were brothers, they were twins. Oh, uh, Herb. Who? Schrader. Schrader. Yeah, Schrader bought this, and I don't know exactly what's in there now, but the thing I can't get over is that sausage hanging over that rack out there, and this is going back to the day of the flies and nothing but horses. Now, I tell you, I wouldn't want to eat that sausage. <laughs> now, they brought all of the uh, produce out like that. It was always set out in front of the store, and the doors were always wide open. You could walk right straight in. They also had a saloon in back of the store. Yeah, there it is, too. That's the Swarm Saloon. Look at the tin ceiling. And there is the spittoons on the floor there. And they're gaboons or whatever you want to call them. And uh, there's your bar. bar that's a big bar along. That's a long bar. Are there a lot of saloons in town? 
oh, there was an awful lot of saloons in town at that time. And I know they were connected, so many of them were connected with grocery stores. And the women just screamed around town here about that. Their husbands would go in there with their paycheck, and they'd get a few groceries, and then they'd go back there and maybe spend the balance of their money on drinking. But they finally, most of the grocery stores, well, they closed up the saloons. That ceiling's a dandy. There were a great many tin ceilings in Maslin at one time. I think, as I remember, there's only one there now, and I'm not sure that's still there. And that's where uh, Meek Segner's were in their basement. There was a barber shop down there, and they had a tin ceiling in that barber shop. This has to be taken during the Cuban or the Spanish-American War because there's a sign on the back of that battleship there saying Cuba. So it was more than likely after they sunk the, the main, and this is one of the parades that we had through the town here. We had a lot of parades in Massillon at that time. These were mostly street fairs. And they come down here, come down Lincoln Way and go south on Erie Street to Tremont. Then they would turn uh, east on Tremont and they would have booths built up along there for about two blocks. This is an 1882 picture. And the reason for the picture is that the new parish house was built right beside the church. That was built in 1882. The church is the original church that they built, and I'm not sure the exact date of that. I think it was around 18, 1832, 34, or something like that. And they, uh, in uh, 1890 or 92, they were going to repair this church, but they found it was such bad shape that they decided to tear it down and build the present St. Timothy Church on this same spot. Another old picture, this is in front of the fire department. At this time, the fire department was on Charles Street. And <coughs> excuse me. And there is a pumper out there with a sprinkling on there. Now, the pumpers at that time, there, seemed many, there was no fire hydrants around through Maslin. So what they would do when there would be a fire, they'd have to go out and throw the hose down into the well, start the pumper up, and that would pump water up. Or they get like to a creek or a canal or a river, something like that. Anyhow, they had to pump the water out of the water supplies and put out the fire, hopefully. Those the, were pulled by horses? Those pulled by horses, yes. The next building back there is the old, what they used to call Hotel Erdl. Erdl was the chief of police here for years. And uh, that was a jail back there. Is that small building? Yes, small building, yes. That was a jail. The next building was Archer's Wagon Shop, and uh, that was built in 1872 or 77, I forget which. It was torn down in uh, 1969. Oh, the, uh, the little jailhouse, is that the one on top of Spring Hill? Now? No, it isn't. I don't know where. They they always keep saying that was a jail. I knew John Gerstemeyer. He was the one. It was his, it belonged to his crew, his wife, that Jack Galehouse did. His wife and her sister, they owned that. And uh, there's uh, John's son is the one that gave that jailhouse. They always said it was a jail. I don't know, but it was such a plain building. And this one looks like it's quite a building here. And uh, he gave that building to uh, Sippo, uh, oh, uh, Spring Hill. That's where it is, isn't it, yeah. Spring Hill? Yeah. Yes, uh, he gave them that. Well, that's an excellent picture of the horses. And there's the buggy first here. The first buggy on the left, that was the chief's buggy, the chief Burkle. And uh, matter of fact, he was the grandfather of uh, Kenny Hogue. If you remember Kenny Hogue, he was a doctor here in Maslin. His father was a dentist here in Maslin. And this is the way they would go to the fires originally. 
And then the second one with the white horse, that was a paddy wagon where they go and pick up the drunks and things like that and take them to the jail. Then you've got your hook and ladder and your steamers. All West Siders remember this. This is a very, very fine picture of the West Side. They all remember this. This was, uh, oh, don't tell me I'm going to go blank on that name. He had that little store there on the west end of the canal, of the river bridge. Uh, I can't think of that name. It saved my life. And uh, he had that store there for years. And when they put the new viaduct in, his store was dismantled and taken away. The bridge, of course, was changed, and that's the end of that. But, oh, what the dickens was that fellow's name? I can still see him walking up and down the street. Can't think of it. Sorry. This is a picture up North Erie Street. This, again, this was taken around 1900. Now, that wagon, the first wagon on the left there, is a peanut wagon. <clears throat> now, I think maybe I've told you that about that before. I'm not sure, but this is another one. There was one on Lincoln on Main Street. There was one back here on Erie Street. And they both had these roasters. And you could hear those roasters, the whistle on those roasters, all over town in the evening when you come downtown to buy uh, to, the shopping stores were open on Saturday nights especially and I don't think they were open any other night but I'm not positive of that though but at any rate uh, everybody who was downtown would have to get a bag of peanuts and they would be cracking peanuts they had peanut shells all over the town I don't know how in the world they ever cleaned up that mess and the building in back of it that's the Warwick block that's one of the last buildings torn down on North Erie Street that's now the uh, parking lot of the First National Bank. Now there is a street light out there. That's a good picture of a street light that we had in those days. That was called an arc light. And I can't imagine them, the kids today would never let that thing stand like that. They pulled those things up by a rope and they wound the rope around the post, the telephone post over there at the side of the street. One of those four corners would have their rope wrapped around the post. And then the man would come and he would carry a stool with these glass insulators like they would have up on the bars there. They'd be the legs that they'd stand on. He would stand on that and he'd let the, the uh, lamp down. Then he would loosen the bulb there and or loosen the bottom of it there, the glass, keep, wipe that all out, take out the old piece of black carbon, put in a brand new piece of white carbon and pull it back up again into place and it was going to be gone and went for the till it turned black again. Now we kids always hound around to grab those pieces of black carbon because we could play follow the leader with that. We, it's one thing we did that was damaging, we would mark the sidewalk and uh, we'd just play games with that side of that carbon. I don't know what's happened here now. Oh. There's Pitzker, Colonel Pitzker standing at the extreme right, right next to the Canal Bridge. And that's his grocery store right here on this side of the Canal Bridge. It's on the north side of Main Street, or Lincoln Way, and that look at that stuff that he brought out to show and to sell. Boy, I was in the retail business all my life, but if I had to drag that out every day and drag it back in at night, I'd have quit that job that first day. Now, did they do that just for the picture, or was that the way they did every day? They did every day every day. See, there's a, a wagon there on the side. It looks like a go-kart there that were out in front. They had everything out there. That's a grocery store? That's a grocery store, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, this one I've had a lot of people dis dispute when I show them these original pictures that I have. I have these pictures originally. And uh, it's the called the Jewel, the Jewel Motor Car Company, and also was called the Croxton Keaton. And that stood down where the Mass and Cleveland Akron Sign Company building is today. That's where they used to make these automobiles. And uh, this paper is dated July the 5th, 1909. And I had this picture in my basement. And that thing fell off in the earthquake that went through here and knocked it off of the spot I had a standing on and broke the glass. Tore part of the picture. 
But anyhow, these some people are old timers around town. So listen, those are not a 19, uh, 199 picture. That'd be about a 1910 or 1911. It's in a 199 newspaper. That's the only thing I can go on there. You still have that paper? I have the paper, but it's torn. But I've got it. Oh yes. Boy, that's a, I've never seen that before. And uh, now here is the what they call the German 45. You notice that has the big hood on there. That's a 45 horsepower. That's a 199 picture. Now look at those tires. Now those tires, they didn't take a rim off. They had to take the tire off the wheel and then put the tire back on the wheel. So that would turn into quite a big project. That's Crox and Keaton. And that's in uh, that same group of pictures there. That's a 19, uh, 199 pictures. That's in front of the old city hall, and I'm just sick about that turn being torn down. Oh, no, that's long before my time. Uh, they went out of business at about 19, I'd say 1912, 14, something like that. Now, Mr. Fluke, who worked down there, told me that this was the first taxi cab in New York City that had dismountable tires and rims. They could take the rim off of the, off the t wheel there and take the tire off the rim and put another one on and put it back on there without the, all that hard work of trying to put the tire on the wheel. That would have been quite a project. This was a taxi cab. By the way, that was called a French 35. This picture was taken in 1894. It's from the Stark Works, uh, Stark County, Artworks of Stark County. And it's looking north on Erie Street. And there you can see now the first big building on the right here, that's the Tremont House, or later on became the Conrad, or the, uh, the, bigger building or the, the big one, this side, on the, the, the right one, on your right side, there, that big white building there. That was started out as the Tremont House, and then uh, the last, when it was burned down, it was called the Erie, Erie House, Erie Hotel. The next building up there is the Masonic Temple. That's the stone block. And by the way, both of those buildings have stone, have the mansard roof on them. And that was not on the original buildings, on either one of them. There's your hitching post up and down the street. No automobiles of any kind. This was all horse and wagon and horse and buggy. This is from my 1870 picture from this of Masson, the aerial view of Masson. It's not an aerial view. They couldn't get up at that time. But this man drew, the, drew that picture like that, the whole setup, and it's just unbelievable what he did with that, uh, that picture. And there's your river the way it used to be. Now you understand why we had so many floods in Maslin. They'd hit that bend and they'd spill all over the street. The whole downtown of Maslin would be covered with water. This is one I call one of my $20 pictures. I wanted to get a picture, and the lady in Cleveland was supposed to have had some pictures <coughs> when I was Taylor Clay's home that I wanted the worst. I wanted the most. And uh, she uh, had worked at the millinery shop up there, what was called the, uh, well, I can't think of the name of that right now either. The building up there right next to the park. They had a millinery shop, and it was in there for years. And <laughs> these are hats that were made in that millinery shop. And she loaned me this picture, which I brought back to Maslin and had, uh, had copied. And the reason I say these are $20, $20 pictures, I had to take my wife along with me and I had to buy her dinner on the way back. Is that the end of that one? Is it? Uh, this last tray we looked at is in my trays is marked 1C. Now that next one, this is called tray number one. Now this is the 1920 uh, Agathon Bas or foot baseball team. Most of these men were professional baseball players that had passed their time in the major leagues. And they came here and they played baseball here. They all had jobs down at the uh, Republic Steel, at that time it was called the Central Steel. Now, the man in the center there was F.J. Griffith, who is a 
was the top man of that particular build plant down here in Maslin. The man in the light tan suit to the right, that is uh, Ben Fairless. And uh, the thing that makes me so mad is when uh, the um, uh, Life magazine wrote the big article on Ben Fairless. They never mentioned Maslin at all. And he came here as a boy in about 1916. And he was here until the late 20s when he left to move into the big, big time seal companies. Those are all men in here. Every one of them is named. And that's a very, very fine picture. This was taken down at the Agathon Ballpark, which is still down there on uh, First Street, out the corner of Firth and Cherry. This is a Sunday picnic, and it's a Sunday school of the Presbyterian Church taken in 1895 on the canal. Now, the buildings on the left, are well, those are all frame buildings. Of course, they're gone now. The big building down at the end is McLean's Wholesale Grocery. Of course, at that t after that, why they built right across the canal, they built out on the front, too. But at that time, it was the only building that was a big, 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 big brick building right there on the canal. Now, this picture, I didn't think I'd ever find. This was the viaduct going over to the Central Steel Company. And this was built in 1915. The red brick building across the street was built, by the, uh, was built as the office building for the Central Steel. Now, that uh, viaduct was used up until about the last, well, let me see, 49, I suppose about 1940, when they stopped them from going across that building. How in the world it carried all that steel across there, I'll never know. But that was the bridge they used, and it went right across there, and you can see about, if you look in front of the building there, and look west, or look east, it went right straight down there. The new viaduct does not go to the same place as the old one. This plane was built by a Maslin man. Uh, his name is on there, can you read it? Reinhardt Asmus, isn't it? Asmus. Asmus. Asmus, yes. He was a Maslin man, and he built that train, that plane. And uh, later on, well, he belonged to the first, the first group of flyers and the early bird flyers of the United States. And uh, that's quite a plane. This is called the Star Wing. It was also built in Maslin. This was built in the late 20s, and uh, it didn't go over. It was a good-looking plane. It was a, did a good job of flying, but it wasn't in the big time like the other planes that had lots and lots of money in back of them. This is a blacksmith shop looking directly east, and there's the steeple of the Presbyterian Church that stood there until 1907 when it was torn down to build the present church. And it was a blacksmith shop, as I said before, and that's where they lived, right on the corner of Federal and uh, First Street Northeast. Now here is your, uh, this picture was taken, the brick building, or the stone building up there, that's where the uh, uh, Independent was published first, or not first, but was the later on when they moved into a building of their own. And they were there till they moved over into the other building on the north, on the uh, west side of uh, North Erie. And this is called again a fire run. <coughs> and they knew it was coming. The photographers were out, and they were taking the pictures of the horses as they raced up the street, pulling one of the fire, uh, one of the fire wagons in back of it. <coughs> 